I won't take much of your time. The pleasure is mine this morning not only to welcome you, but also to introduce the chairman of the conference, uh, Mr. Bud Slabbert. A round of applause, please. I don't have to say welcome. He did already. I'm going to make it short. Bud asked me to speak a little bit about my experiences um, and my background, so that's what I'm going to do for you guys today. So here we go. October 22nd, 2003 was the first time I ever saw an aircraft carrier from the air. At that time, I was uh, my early 20s. I was a very young guy that cared. Um, and I had my entire life, I said, you know what, I want to be a fighter pilot. I watched some movie, you guys may have heard of it, a long time ago, Top Gun, back in the 80s. And I said, man, that looks cool. Fighter pilots get to wear flight suits, they get to wear cool sunglasses, they date their instructors, they ride motorcycles. This sounds like a great job for me. And then I saw the boat. Over 300 meters long, carries 6,000 people, but the reality of it is, when you see it from the air, that thing is tiny. As I approached the boat that first time, I thought to myself, what the hell did I get myself into? Why am I gonna do this? I'm gonna kill myself. I actually thought, maybe if I turn the jet around and head back to the beach, that I could join the Air Force. I don't play golf, but maybe they'll take me, so I was really excited about that. But as I approached the break, I kind of calmed myself down and said, you know what? The Navy does a great job training. So let me rely on my training, try to calm myself down, and I entered the brake. So I'll tell you what the brake is real quick. The carrier pattern is designed around the safety of the ship. So when the ship, we call it the boat, term of endearment, is trapping jets, it has to steam in a predictable direction, pretty much into the wind. That's dangerous for the ship. So the Navy designed a pattern where the jets come in at a very high speed into what's called the break. You come in about 800 knots, 800 feet, excuse me, 500 knots. SOP is 350, but we always bump it up for the safety of the ship. And right at the bow of the ship, sometimes a little quicker, we break. We go into a nice level turn across the horizon. And more importantly than the safety of the ship, it looks really cool. As you come in over the ship, there's an old saying that the only people who think fighter pilots are cool are other fighter pilots, so we try to impress each other. And that's what we do. And there's nothing more sexy, by the way, than the Tomcat with its wings back coming into the break. So once I got my jet on downwind, I said I was going to calm myself down. I lied. I was scared. I looked over at the jet or at the ship and I said, man, I can't do this. I started praying. My father had passed away recently. I started talking to my dad. I said, what am I going to do? Can I do this? Am I going to kill myself? I can't turn around now. Again, I fell back on my training. So when you get to the downwind, you go through a mantra in your head. You're only worried about th three things, airspeed, altitude, distance from the boat. And you go through that in your mind over and over again. Airspeed, 600 feet, excuse me, airspeed on speed, meaning angle of attack. Altitude, 600 feet, distance from the boat. You want to be about a mile from the boat. Airspeed, altitude, DME. And then you approach the end of the pattern, which is called the 180. The 180 is where you roll into a 35 degree angle of bank, come off on that power just a little bit, and start a rate of descent of about 650 to 700 feet a minute. And that first part of that turn is all on instruments. So if you think about this, you just switch from one mantra to another. Now your rate of descent, AOA, angle bank. And you keep going through that mantra in your head over and over again. AOA, rate of descent, angle bank. About 90 degrees into the turn, what's called the 90, you look out at the ship to kind of assess your pattern. And the minute you look at that ship and realize it didn't get any bigger, again, your heart rate starts going up, you start psyching yourself out, and you calm yourself down and fall back on your training. So then you hit what's called the 45 or the 45 degree position. That's when you call the ball. The ball of a set of, is a set of lights on the left side of the ship. That's how you assess your glide slope. That's how you know whether you're right on the right pattern. It's a series of lights. The lights will tell you if you're high. The lights will tell you if you're low. So at the 45 degree position, you look back outside of the boat, take a breath, and you call the ball. 111 Gossack ball. And Paddles, who's the little guy that stands on the deck and waves you in, rogers your ball very calmly. Roger ball. That kind of calms you down a little bit. And that day, Paddles was my, excuse me, was my instructor. OK. so. Then you roll wings level, again, standardized. 
start to roll wings level, come off on the power a little bit, and assess your glide slope. And now your mantra has changed. Ball, am I in glide slope? Line up, meaning am I lined up with the ship? Now for those of you guys who are unfamiliar, the aircraft carrier is steaming at 20 knots, and it has an angled deck, which means the runway is always moving to the right. So you're constantly doing check turns to stay on pattern. If you stare at the deck, called spotting the deck, you go low and you crash into the back of the ship. So you only want to glance at it. Ball, line up, AOA. Again, ball, line up, AOA. And that's it. And you do that over and over again. It takes about 15 seconds. Then you crash into the ship at 700 feet a minute rate of descent. No flare, right? As soon as you touch the ship, full power with the left hand. The reason you do that is if you miss a wire because of a poor pattern, I had a pretty bad pattern that first time, you will basically go around, do a touch and go. If you're back on the power and you miss the wire, there's not enough time for the jet engine to spool up and you go off the end of the ship. So again, you hit the deck, 700 feet a minute down, full power. And that, that movement I just did with my left hand is ingrained in your mind through repetition over and over and over again at the field before you ever see the boat. Okay, I trapped that day, it was great. My knees were shaking so bad that I couldn't taxi the aircraft. And the funny thing is, in my entire career, from the first aircraft carrier landing to the last, my knees always shook after that thing, especially at night. All right, so what does that have to do with aviation in the Caribbean? I think we have some things in common, would you agree? You know, short runways with regards to seaplanes, sometimes no runways. We have difficult approaches. We have dynamic weather. There's lots and lots of water underneath us in the Navy. Well, there's lots and lots of water out here too, which creates a little margin for error. And bottom line, what we do, whether it's in the Navy or flying airplanes in the Caribbean, there's a higher level of risk associated with that compared to your average runway to runway operation. So when we started Tropic Ocean Airways, and we started hiring seaplane pilots. We started hiring those high-time seaplane pilots from Alaska, because that's what we were told to do. Nothing against Alaska flying. It's very, very difficult, just, just a different type of flying. And we were struggling a little bit with the culture of our company. So I took a step back and I said, what does the Navy do? How does the Navy take somebody from zero experience and in 240 hours, they teach them how to land on an aircraft carrier. I mean, think about that. Would you hire a 240-hour pilot to land at St. Bart's? Probably not, right? 240 hours. They don't go out into the public and look for people who know how to land on aircraft carriers. They don't exist. So I took a step back and said, how does the Navy do it, and how can I bridge that gap to the civilian operation? So what did I do? Well, first of all, the Navy hires for attitude. The Navy doesn't look for people with a lot of flight time. The Navy looks for the right people with, who have good work ethic. Good work ethic means they study at night. They know their airplanes. They know their positions. They study everything about the operation, not just how to fly an airplane. And they have great attitude, meaning they can take criticism. They don't think that they know everything. They have a lot to learn and they recognize that, regardless of, you know, Navy pilots have big egos. We're actually very self-critical. And then they train, and they train, and they train some more. And every time they go through a training program, that training program is debriefed, and it's improved. So we said, okay, let's see if we can do the same thing. So we changed our hiring practices. We started hiring people based on attitude. Flying was important, obviously, but that was secondary to willingness to work, willingness to take a debrief. One of the questions I always ask on the third interview, everybody goes through three interviews, and the last interview is usually with me, I say, tell me how you screwed up in an airplane. Now think about that, a pilot, you know, telling a potential employer a mistake that he made in an airplane. And if a pilot says, you know what, I never make mistakes, interview's over. It's an important question to ask. And then we train for skill. We changed our training program we are continually evolving that training program, meaning that every training class that goes through, we debrief that class, we figure out what we need to do better next time, and we improve it. 
And the first week of our training program has nothing to do with flying. Every single employee goes through orientation training together. And it's culture-based. And it's customer service-based. And it's attitude-based. And then we go to the flying, which is the fun part, right? We had very positive results. You know, we have 24 solid pilots, guys and girls, all walks of life, all ages, that all have the same attitude, the same worth at work ethic, and have all been trained the same. And it's fun to see. And I know we have a lot of work to do, but it's been great. So what did I learn from that story? Invest in your people. Prioritize attitude over experience. That's that quality over quantity argument. Develop and maintain a proper training program. And by maintain, you don't just keep it status quo. You continually improve that training program and make it better. We have to focus on the mentorship and development of our people. Pilots usually have a goal to some, someday fly for the major airlines. Fine, I'm still gonna spend money and time investing in that man or woman because if they stick around, I have a better employee. If they leave me and go to the major airlines, great. I just improved the major airlines by training that person and developing them. And not just in the flying portion of it, but the leadership skills. Core values are non-negotiable. I'll let somebody make a mistake in the company, but if they are against the core values, we're gonna have a conversation. And that person might not stick around the company because the core values develop the culture of the company and they maintain the culture of the company. And finally, we, we employ our leaders at all levels to lead, meaning the most junior person in the company can walk into my office and say, hey, Rob, I disagree with this and here's why and here's what we need to do better, and I'm gonna to listen to that person. They're empowered to lead me. They can lead sideways and they can lead up the chain of command. So that's what I learned from that story. I, I know I, I was given 40, what, 40 minutes, so I've got two more stories for you. you. Guys, stop me if you get bored or if you want some coffee. Okay, fast forward to, it was er, late 2005, somewhere over Iraq. We were just coming off the tanker after about a five hour mission. And now the, the missions, every third day we'd fly over Iraq on deployment, and those missions were about six and, a, six and a half to seven hours long, usually went in late into the night. So we're pretty tired at this point. We get a phone call, phone call, we get a radio call uh, from the net saying, hey look, we had some special forces guys track some bad guys into a house. We want you guys to take out that house. We were the closest asset with weapons on board. And we were pretty far away, so that's kind of like a license to steal. We go full afterburner, supersonic across Iraq, and we enter the target area. Now, I was the, the junior wingman, meaning that we had a lead jet, with a senior air crew, senior pilot, senior Rio, backseater. And then I had a senior Rio in my backseat, who was my maintenance officer, very senior. So I was flying wing at this time, and it was gonna be a single jet strike, meaning the lead was gonna drop the bomb. So my job was simply to hang back and be prepared to drop if we had to. Sure enough, the lead has a malfunction, can't arm the weapon. So with 30 seconds to spare, they pass the lead over to me, the junior guy. I ready the jet, my Rio and I walk through the checklist, and we employ the weapon. And a few seconds later, I look down, big explosion. My first thought was, I screwed this up. I was rushed. My God, I might have killed some innocent people. So for the next 10 seconds, I was really upset about it. Until we get the call, you know, from the guys on the ground. Hey, Shaq, Tomcat 1-1, Shaq, great job. You know, have a nice flight home. So we fly back, do the night trap. Again, my knees are shaking, typical night trap. And it's kind of like, you know, a big deal, especially at that time, because that was the first drop from our air wing. So you land and everybody's high-fiving you and hey, congratulations, whatever. And we go upstairs and we go to the debrief and we start walking through the mission. And when we get to the weapons employment point, um, it's discovered by watching our tapes that I employed the weapon at the very edge of what's called the LAR. The LAR is a launch acceptability region. It's a theoretical 3D space, uh, 3D uh, uh, space in the air, basically, that as you um, enter that space, if you're in the heart of that LAR and you employ the weapon, you have a high probability of target destruction and success. We were right on the edge of that LAR. So walking back through it in my mind, um, the lead was originally on the edge of the LAR, didn't recognize it, passed the lead over to me. My senior backseat didn't recognize it. So I could have simply said, well, 
guys, you know, I was the most junior guy. It wasn't my fault. You know, the bomb blew up on target. I did the right thing, right? Well, I didn't. And here's why. And I'll walk you through why I didn't say that and why I would say we had a more productive discussion. We have what's called, this thing's loading, sorry about that. Who's ever computer that is, your Dropbox came up. Um, we have what's called a debrief, and I mentioned it earlier. A debrief in the Navy and a debrief in the military is an objective discussion. It's not a time to point fingers when there's a failure. It's a time to walk through the mission objectively without emotion. We assess our execution, we identify any failures that there were, and we find out what those lessons were from those failures. And then what we do is take those lessons and create solutions and apply those solutions to the operation and make us better. There's certain rules. No ego. Again, right, fighter pilots, big ego. No ego. So I can be the most junior guy in a squadron and you can be the admiral of the ship and I can debrief you and tell you what you did wrong and you're gonna take it from me and vice versa. And it's tremendous power if you think about that in a debrief. We always set the tone. It's not you screwed up, it's we screwed up. This is what we did as a section. It's not who's right, it's what's right. And how can we prevent this in the future? What happened and what can we do in the future to make sure it doesn't happen again? I always teach it as OLT with an acronym. You assess your objectives versus, versus your execution. So for, first of all, you gotta figure out what your objectives were, right? Was my objective to bomb a target or is my objective to properly launch a weapon? Has a different answer, correct? Then we figure out the what, why. And the L stands for the lessons. We pull the lessons out from that what, why. And then the most important step is the T. We transfer those lessons, meaning that if I learn a lesson, that doesn't help you. It just helps me. And that's very selfish to not share those lessons with other members of your team. And by the way, other members outside your team. So in this case, this uh, Iraq strike, we walk through the objectives. Objective number one, mutual support. Objective number two, proper launch of the weapon. And objective number three, target destruction. What happened? Well, the lead aircraft malfunction, malfunction, so the wing takes the lead. The weapons delivered on the edge of LAR. Notice we don't get into the why just yet. We just say the what, objectively. This is what happened. I don't stand up and say, whoa, wait, wait a second. No, this is the facts, objectively, right? Target's destroyed. And then we get into the why. The weapon was delivered on the edge of LAR. Why? Well, the lead was on the edge of the parameters. And the wingman, the wingman, wasn't paying attention and didn't recognize it and speak up. Wingman takes the lead on the edge of the parameters and doesn't realize it. The lead now has dropped the pack, so the lead doesn't recognize it. The wingman made an assumption that the lead was gonna drop safely, so the wingman didn't have his jet ready to go. And finally, there was a huge reliance, if you think about that, on rank in the cockpit. And we see that a lot in the civilian world with CRM, right? The junior guy doesn't want to speak up and ask a question, and therefore there's an incident. Great. That's the why. So, then we go through the objectives. Did we have mutual support? Was there mutual support within the cockpit? And was there mutual support within the section? I'd say no. Did we employ the weapon within parameters? Well, we were close. So that's kind of like in the middle. We were close to being outside of parameters. Finally, was the target destroyed? Yeah, the target was destroyed. We did a good job, right? So mission success? What do you guys think? Did we succeed at that mission? Absolutely not. No. As far as the guys on the ground are concerned, yeah, we did a great job. But internally, we said, you know what? We screwed up. We identified failures. We identified the lessons. And most importantly, we transferred the lessons. We said, you know what? We're gonna have an all officers meeting and we're gonna discuss what happened. And that's what we did. And then we realized that, you know what? What you learn in training will dissipate over time. So we have to refresh prior to every flight. So we started briefing those LARs prior to every flight to make sure that they were always fresh in our head and we didn't rely on the checklist or memory that fades. 
So why is that important? Well, when you see that culture take hold of an organization, and not just any, an organization, but an industry, it's a beautiful thing. When people can come together and talk openly about mistakes and say, look, this is what I learned, and this is how you can improve from my mistakes, the entire whole improves, not just the individual, not just the organization. I threw that slide up because I'll give you a good example of what, what I mean by debrief culture when it's not forced and it just becomes second nature. Air Force Thunderbirds, good buddies of mine, I was at the Daytona 500 a couple of months ago and they did a beautiful flyby. Just like that, bomb burst, you know, it was gorgeous and they come to a party and everybody's so excited to meet these guys. And for those of you guys who don't know where the Air Force Thunderbirds are, a demonstration team. Somebody shows them a picture of their flyby and says, wow, this was amazing. And literally, this is a conversation. Well, you see that? I was a little low here. And then the next guy, yeah, I kind of pulled a little soon here, so I was a little out of position, and then the timing was off. And then the next guy, yeah, we ended up three seconds early with that national anthem, so we could have done better next time. Now think about that. These are the Thunderbirds, you know, the tight flight suits and handsome, you know, haircuts and everything else. And all they did was bash their performance. And it wasn't really bashing. That's just so ingrained in their culture that they look for things wrong so they could fix it. So what did we learn? What did I learn? And how do we apply it? Well, internally, you have to create and support a program that encourages that kind of open discussion. You need to encourage open dialogue. And you have to resist the urge to punish mistakes if the mistakes were not willful neg negligence. And that solutions have been not only discovered, but put in place to prevent it from happening in the future. And then you need to basically empower your people to be open about this and discuss it with each other without fear of, of punishment, without fear of, I would say, looking bad in front of their peers, which is, I think, prevalent in civilian aviation. So recently we had an experience in our company where we had an issue and a crew made a mistake or an error in the cockpit, and he called an all-pilots meeting and he stood up in front of the pilots and he said, look guys, here's what I did wrong. Here's what I learned from it. And here's what we should do as a company to put in our SOPs and our training to make sure it doesn't happen again. I almost cried. I was like, that's cool. So imagine if we adopted that mentality as an industry, what it could do for the industry. I got time for one more story? Okay. Top Gun. Finally made it, right? 2009. So I was excited after, you know, my entire life working towards this moment. So I go to Top Gun. I was like, you know what? I'm going to play volleyball, ride motorcycles, date my instructor, maybe sing in the bars. You know, not so much. The real Top Gun is studying, mission planning, briefing, debriefing. Studying, mission planning, briefing, debriefing. Oh, by the way, you fly a little bit too while you're there. Everything that they do at Top Gun is standardized. Everything. How you brief, how you debrief, how you walk to the jet, how you start your jet up, how you taxi, how you take off, how you join up, how you join up after the mission, how you come to the break, how you land. And when I say everything is standardized, they grade you on this, even the radio calls. So if you think about this, I, had a, I was leading a large force exercise of 26 jets. I did mission planning all night long. I briefed it, I flew it, I debriefed it. Everything went almost perfect. I sat down with the Top Gun instructor at the end, and he said, yeah, Rocco is my call sign. Rocco, great job, this and that, whatever. He goes, you know, that gear call you made in the pattern, you said landing gear threw down and locked. The call is gear threw down and locked. Make sure you fix that next time. That's how standardized it was. And when I say standard, everything standardized, I mean everything. How you hold a pointer is standardized. You'll get points taken off if you hold it like this, or if you do what I do, which is I'm Italian, I talk with my hands. And in the picture of the water bottle, true, sto water bottle, true story, there's two techniques that Top Gun teaches. One is keep the cap on the water bottle. So if you need to take a sip while you're drinking, you take the cap off and you take a sip. That could be distracting, but that's one technique. And the next technique is leave the cap off. So I'm not distracting the audience while I'm taking the cap off the water bottle. However, if you hit it, it can spill on your computer, right? So there's goods and others to both, 
and they teach basically pick one and standardize to it. And we're going to tell you, we're going to catch you if you're not. Notice I'm standardized with the cap on the bottle. Okay, so why do they do that? Why do standard operating procedures exist? Well, they standardize the routine. Everything that you do every single day should be standardized. Why? Well, flying around the boat, missions like that, it takes a lot of brain power. Flying around the Caribbean in dynamic weather and short runways, that takes a lot of brain power. And by standardizing the routine, you save the brain power for the mission at hand. And there's a famous you know, person that did this all the time, right? That was the Steve Jobs, always wore the turtleneck because he didn't want to think about it in the morning, right? It bridges the technique gap. So if I fly a caravan amphib and you fly a caravan amphib into the same runway, well, I've got my way of doing things, you know, hey, how do you land on that runway? Well, what I do is this and what you do is that. No, standardize because there's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it. And when we figure out what the right way is and we teach everybody how to do it properly. So that bridges that gap, right? Why is the guy on the left at 10 feet above the, the road and the guy on the right is 20 feet above the road? What's standard going in there? How come that is not standardized? I'm sure it is, he's probably just not following it. Um, so it's, you get rid of the how I do it and it becomes a how we do it or what's in the SOP. And it bridges the regional distance gap. So I knew as, a, as a, a Navy pilot that was stationed in Key West at the time, that I could go to Fallon, Nevada and Top Gun, and everything I do in Fallon, Nevada is exactly the same as I do in Key West. And I've flown, I'm flying with people I've never flown with in my life. Now, everything is standardized. And we see this a lot in the 121 industry, but you don't see that too much in the small aircraft industry. So imagine if we come together and standardize. So if my operation is in South Florida and I have a a seasonal operation in New York, an operation in the Bahamas, an operation down here, my pilot should be able to go anywhere in the world and fly that airplane exactly the same way. All right, so what did I learn? Always standardize the routine. I don't have a whole lot of brain power here, so I need to save it for the mission. We standardize across skill levels and teach competency. Some people, what I've noticed, land an airplane a certain way because they don't know better. Well, that's just what I learned. That's how I learned to do a short field approach. Well, let me show you the proper way and train you to do it. Standardize across all operations. And finally, again, empower the people to make decisions in non-standard uh, experiences or non-standard examples. So SOPs are great. I believe, and the Navy believes, that rules are meant to be broken because not everything is always going to go to plan. And you can't write an SOP that's 1,000 pages long. So your people have to be empowered to digress from that SOP, provided that they brief it. We say, look, we're going to digress from this SOP, and here's why. And then it gets debriefed. Maybe it means we have to change the SOP. But people have to be empowered to understand that difference. So bottom line, I told you guys three stories. I learned some things from the Navy. Selection of personnel and culture is important. It's paramount to a good organization. You have to invest in your people. You have to develop and train them, even if they plan on leaving you someday. Standardize everything you do, even the water bottles. Create a culture of the debrief where people feel comfortable to openly talk about the mistakes, just like I shared my mistakes with you today. And empower leadership at all levels. I don't care who you are in an organization or where you exist in the, in the chain, you should be able to lead and influence somebody else, even, even your boss. I truly believe that. So I've heard this over the years. I've been doing this for about eight years now, eight years with Tropic Ocean Airways. Somebody said, you know what? This isn't the Navy. That's not going to work in a civilian world. This is not going to work in small aircraft aviation. Well, how do we make this work? Well, you kind of have to forego sometimes near-term margins and invest in the future of the organization. So we tried that. And well, did we survive? Well, this was our experience. Over the last two years, we've gone from 16 to 75 employees. We grew from two to 11 aircraft. We serviced 15,000 guests in 2016, almost double the year before. And we did that with five-star reviews. And by the way, the five-star reviews aren't because we have a perfect operation. We screw it up a lot. What we do is we incorporate our guests and our resort partners and even the governments into our debriefs to figure out what can we do better next time. 
And finally, what we do is we give back to our communities. So part of the culture of our company, um, we're, we're very thankful and blessed to be able to operate in the islands of the Bahamas. Now, if you think about that, I'm a U.S. company, and they give me the permission and authority to land there. So when they needed our help, we help them. Two years in a row, there is uh, two large hurricanes that uh, hit the Bahamas two years in a row, unfortunately. And we shut down our operation, and in two years, we carried about 100,000 pounds of cargo, rescued about 33 people with seaplanes off the beaches when the runways were underwater. And we did that not because, you know, we were hoping to get accolades for it. This is, this is my entire company gets on board with this. This is the culture of the company that we built from day one. So it was really neat to see everybody kind of come together and, and help when time is needed. We had you know, a couple of pilots in the back hold there, for example, running, running trips into the Long Island. Um, no complaints from the guys working day and night. It was really cool. But anyways, that's great. We did all that, but you know what? We actually turned profit in uh, 2016. So I think we prove the model that yes, you can invest in the near term for the longevity of the organization. So how do we strengthen the industry? Well, we need to think outside the box. We heard that last night too, right? I'm not that young, I'm in my 40s, you know? But there's a lot, a lot of people out there younger than me that have great ideas for the aviation industry. And I think we should listen to them. The old way of doing thing, things isn't always the best way. So we need to think outside the box. And those organi organizations that think outside the box, we need to come together and create partnerships. If we come together and create partnerships with that mutual support mentality, instead of us competing over the same thousand people that fly between one route, perhaps the two of us together can bring in 2,000 people to that island by coming together and actually sharing our exp experiences in a, in a forum just like this. Travel industry, the resorts, ministries of tourism, you need to find and identify those partnerships and embrace them. Because really, it's, what, it's you who are going to drive that traffic. It's you who are going to make those organizations better. And finally, you know, you can't regulate this. You can't regulate culture. So what the governments need to do is support those partnerships and support those organizations. There's a lot of um, archaic rules out there in the FAA and ICAO that came to be from, you know, technology that's 70 years old, single engine over water, things like that. We need to kind of come together and say, how do we take aviation in the Caribbean in the future? And how could we, the operators, the tourism industries, and the governments come together and create a better product for the future? So bottom line, guys, this is a great forum. I am, I am honored to be here because it's a great opportunity for me, who, who knows absolutely nothing of the industry yet, to learn from you. And we can share our experiences this week. I think we could work together to improve aviation because bottom line, the people in this room, we have a responsibility, a responsibility to create a better product for the future. So guys, that's all I have today. Thanks so much for listening to me. I appreciate that. I think that was great. Uh, this is exactly what I wanted for the conference, these kind of presentations. But I also want people to stand up now and ask a question. You probably have a question, guaranteed, somebody. Please do, don't be shy. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Leadership is influencing. I can't tell you what to do, but I can show you the right way to do it and, and try to push you in that direction. That doesn't mean if I'm your boss or you're my boss, it works both ways. He has the definition of leadership. Anybody else? No, sir? Negative, no. Yeah, and I think it works, by the way. You know, we have this um, thing right now in this, in this, 
I see this world we live in called millennials, right? Everybody thinks millennials, are, you can't work with millennials. Eh? There's no way, it's gonna be a different world. Well, reality of it is, is whether you're a millennial or you're a 10,000 hour Alaska pilot who has a bunch of, uh, I would say, bad habits, you have free will. You have free will. So it's important for us to show them, whether it's a millennial with no flight time or a very senior pilot, to show them the why behind what we teach and then hopefully they make the decision to follow that. It's really up to them. All we can do is influence them and hope you'll see a change. So no, I, we actually have high time pilots in my company, you know, and we've watched people develop. We have older people in my company that came to work for me in different, you know, departments and to watch them develop and change over time, it's beautiful. You just need to honestly, I guess, the one thing I'd say is you never give up on them. If you see a slight change, that means you've made a crack, you just keep pushing forward. Did I answer your question? Okay, sir. What are some of the regular, oh, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Corey Levens from the BVA. Um, quick one, what are some of the regulatory constraints you receive um, using your Cessna caravan in the Caribbean? Well, um, there's one that's in particular in the FAA, and I know ICAO is, I think, making some changes, is that, um, that single engine over water restriction. That single engine over water restriction is, was designed around, you know, 100-year-old technology with piston airplanes. The Navy, I know Rob's going to talk about this later, the Navy has always been twin engine jets around the boat. Why? Because if you lose an engine, you can still come back to the boat. The new joint strike fighter is single engine. Why? Because of the technology. I think we just have to embrace it, that the technology makes, you know, the engines much more reliable. And I actually would feel safer in a single engine brand new turbine than an old piston. Excuse me. Did that answer your question? Okay, sir. Ma'am. Sorry. Sorry. So, where are you sourcing your pilots? We have a worldwide pilot board. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's your minimum? And obviously, you're training is really good. Uh, but uh, so, what's your minimum and how are you sourcing your pilots? It's a great question. So, um, what we did was we actually created an um, SIC program that was F FA approved. So the Caravan's a single pilot airplane. We always fly them with two pilots. So we can bring people into the right seat with you know, the commercial in the minimum amount of time. And then we partnered with um, aviation schools, like Broward College, and we created a pathway. And on the back end of us, we partnered with Silver and Frontier. So now, if you think about this, I can get in front of a brand new student at Broward College, give him my, hey, this is what you need to succeed speech, and then in two years, he comes to work for me, he or she. And then from there, they go to Silver and then Frontier, so they have a pathway. So we're really focusing on the young people. And we also hire very experienced. We'll put stuff out there, we, we hear from word of mouth, you know, some Alaska pilots wanna fly in the Caribbean, which is a much warmer place to live. But the majority of our pilots actually come through the ranks. So now our entire pilot group has all started in the right seat of the operation. And by the way, it doesn't matter how much flight time you have, you always start in the right seat of the operation. Yeah, so that's how we source our pilots. We're actually looking to develop, I would say, a cadre of pilots and give them the experience, but we bring them in sometimes with very low time in the right seat. Are you able to meet your uh, hiring goal? It's been tough, because we're growing fast. It's been very tough, but we've so far been able to meet it. Uh, Holt, who's our uh, chief pilot in the back, has how many interviews you do, do in a week? 20, something like that? Yeah, we've got, what, six, seven starting this class? Yeah, yeah. So it's been tough, but we're finding them. There's, look, there's a lot, of, a lot of people out there that are not only looking for a job, but looking for a good career. And I think if you show them a career, they'll come work for you. Sure, sure. Well, look, it actually works both ways. So you take the millennial, who, and that millennial you know, loses the GPS because they learn how to fly in a G1000, they're like, I can't find Bimini. I'm like, just go east for 50 miles, it's there, you know? The flip side of that, though, is you get a lot of people who don't, aren't familiar, like the older, older folks who aren't familiar with that technology and don't want to, I would say, they're scared of it. And they say, well, I don't want to turn that thing on. So you've got to create a training program that trains both. I believe in stick and rudder skills, I believe in dead reckoning, I believe in learning on steam gauges, and then having an operation develop you into becoming technology, technologically savvy. You need both. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. You know, we, um, in the Navy, the, uh, I was an adversary pilot, meaning I trained air combat, flying an F-5, 
you know, no computers in this thing. And I fought an F-22 with the state-of-the-art airplane. And I, I, didn't, I didn't beat him, but he didn't beat me. And I kept the fight neutral. Why? Because I fell back on blocking and tackling and the basics of dogfighting, where he was relying on his systems. So there's, you need to find a healthy balance in your training programs. There's, anybody else? Don. Mm -hmm. uh, more interest in the airlines partnering with you and doing some training of uh, water landing? Yeah, not, um, not on the 121 level yet. Um, one of our board members on the board of directors at Delta, and you know, we've been starting those conversations. But, but yeah, the, I would say the, the regional airlines are very interested, and so are the schools. Because I think Sully's a great example about doing something non-standard because you understand the jet. Right? He turned on the APU, which is step 15, in the checklist. Why? Because he was trained well. He had this self-study self initiative to understand the jet. So I think by drilling that into people at the very early stages of their career, you're going to have more sullies out there in the future. So, Robbie. Pilots, when Rob started out, his plan was to hire the most experienced, highest time seaplane pilots possible. That's what the insurance companies want to hear. We had to go into the markets, introduce the insurance carriers to Rob, and convince them that long term, you will be safer with these lower time pilots that they're trained properly than a guy coming from Alaska with thousands of hours and landings that thinks he knows it all. And once we convinced the insurance companies that this in-house training was appropriate, and he got the FA to approve his in-house Czech airmen, he had carte blanche to hire anybody with any minimum, and the open pilot warranty for his policy was dissolved. And I know that's always a problem in the Caribbean. I insure 40 separate operations in the Caribbean, and the underwriters tend to want, oh, we, you know, it has to have at least 1,000 flight hours, 500 multi, and 50 make a model to fly an islander into uh, St. Bart's. Well, in reality, if your program is designed properly, like Rob proved, we just had to change the, the minds of the insurance companies and create a new culture that it's not how many hours they have, it's how they were trained. And I think a lesson is well learned that I've applied, that Rob taught me with decades of experience in the insurance industry. Before I met Rob, I thought the more hours a pilot had, the better he was. I'm now convinced that is archaic thought and I'm now convinced the insurance companies, so I've had a lot of success over time in the Caribbean, particularly where you have a smaller pool of pilots and more difficult approaches, landings, runways shorter, that they can't just go out and hire people because the governments are going to hire locals and there's a sh small pool of pilots. And with proper training, I've convinced the insurance companies that Rob's way of thinking was the right way. And until I met Rob, I thought the better more time you had, the better pilot you were. And I knew no longer believe that. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. I'm, you know, the airlines have known that for a long time, right? Because they'll hire um, military pilots a little lower flight time than they would a civilian pilot. And it's just because of the training. It's nothing to do with anything else. But the hour levels are arbitrary. I mean, look, a 2,000-hour pilot has a hell of a lot more experience than a 250-hour pilot. But if I said, you know, I want to go work for this airline and their minimums are 2,000 hours and I've got a short amount of time to do it, what am I going to do? I'm going to go up and just fly in circles for 2,000 hours. I don't learn anything. You know, so I think you know, it's tough to regulate this. But if the government's not, not just look at the amount of flight time you have, but also your background and vet that training that you have, I think we're going to have, I would say, better hiring practices going forward. Because it's hard to regulate hours. You can set that limit as high as you want, and someone's just going to go get those hours somewhat, one way or another. So that's, I know we're short on time. So. I could talk all day. Yeah. So, no. Well, no, Thanks. <laughs>